Hello, and welcome back to Talking Faces. Thank you guys so much for your feedback. I'm Dr. Raul Cheto, and I'm joined by my co-host, Dr. Lee Walker. Thank you so much for the feedback that we had from uh, the YouTube uh, podcast. It was phenomenal, so please keep up uh, with watching, and, and do um, please comment below here. So today, Raul, what are we, what we talking about? So today, Lee, um, we're going to talk about the tear trough. Now, the tear trough is, is quite a popular area in terms of requests from patients, but most importantly, a lot of colleagues and a lot of practitioners come to us and they ask for tear trough training. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, it is. It's, a, it's, a, it's an incredibly popular treatment and it's also a, a popular training requirement uh, as well, or request. So I'm going to ask you a question is, why is it so popular for both patient and practitioner, the tear trough. So in terms of treatment and in terms of training, why do you think it's so popular? Well, first of all, in, in terms of requests from patients, I think you know the aging process, one of the first areas where it becomes very noticeable is actually the uh, infraorbital area, which is uh, very apparent. And you know the tear trough, which I know we'll get into it, um, it's not a deformity, I think it's an anatomical feature, uh, becomes deeper and then we develop a uh, hollowing all around the infraorbital area. And you know, that happens quite early on in the aging process. And I think that's one of the reasons why a patient requested. And that's another reason why practitioners want to train uh, for this particular treatment. Yeah, you do get those changes first in the uh, periorbital area. And uh, Dina Wan, uh, with her publication, uh, showed how the face ages in this systematic methodical approach. I think we're also programmed to look at each other in a certain way and these gaze patterns where we look at eyes and mouth really um, think we think that patients will look at their eyes and say oh, I look so tired or you know I look unwell or people thinking out and looking unhappy so I think that's for the patients are driven really by how they look and I think the desire for training is born out of the patients uh, request request really yeah. for, for that number one area uh, and interestingly um, for men the periorbital area is uh, the second most requested treatment uh, after her transplantation so again we're not we're, we're not seeing a gender difference here both both genders are, are looking at the tear trough as an important area on their on their face you're absolutely right and a uh, quick story, um, because I know we're going to get into the anatomy, the technique and everything with a little bit more detail and the aging process. Um, a quick story, when I first started in aesthetics, um, I was doing it part time like most of us and um, I was doing an ENT clinic and then I had this patient uh, come in, young guy, um, worked in the banking industry and, um, and he said, I, I saw this leaflet, do you do cosmetic procedures as well? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I do. Um, and he's like, can you do something about my under eyes? Because it's the, you know, for a young patient, for a young person to look tired in that line of business, um, it's something very important and something that they really, really pay attention to. So I think that's one of the reasons why, as you were saying, for men, hair transplant and tear troughs are common treatments. Yeah, it's a, it's a huge area. But well, I think there is uh, confusion with patients and practitioners on on what is a tear trough or what is a dark circle or what is these under eye bags. I think there's lots of uh, words that they use which are, are not interchangeable really. So I think we have to really discuss the definition of a Absolutely. tear trough because patients will come in with dark circles under their eyes. It could be just racial pigmentation, it could be PIH, it could be just the vascularity shining through. Uh, it could be the, the, the color, the violaceous color of the muscle through the very thin skin. Lots of reasons really why we have this um, uh, dark circles underneath the eyes. So I think, what would you be your definition, Raul, of, uh, of the tear trough? Well, the, the tear trough will be the attachment of the, the ligament, which is medial. So it would be from the medial canthus to the mid papillary line, that small area would be the tear trough. Yeah, right. yeah. I mean, sorry, it's yes. it's uh, the definitions uh, change throughout the literature, and as you say, it's one of those osseocutaneous ligaments uh, from the medial canthus to the mid pupillary line, and it's also been a demarcation between the palpable and orbital parts of the orbicularis oculi muscle. And you were talking about a deformity. Uh, yeah, do we think it's a deformity? 
you know, it's an anatomical feature. However, the aging process does affect it, and that's one of the reasons why patients come to see us. Um, but the result of the aging process, Lee, correct me if I'm wrong, is not just the deepening uh, of the tear trough and you know the result of the nasojugal groove, it's also the hollowing of the lateral part of the orbit, which is what we call the palpiromalar groove. And with that hollowing um, that you know involves changes in different layers, you know, from the bone up to the skin and changes in the fat, then the third step of the aging process is the uh, infra or the intraorbital bag, the, the eyelid bag, which I find that a lot of patients, they come to seek treatments once they have a lower eyelid bag mm. for some reason. Yeah, I, I, like you rightly said, this aging process is, is incredibly complex because it's a complex uh, area of anatomy. But it's also uh, multi-layer, so we age through every every tissue layer here as well. So it's not just about addressing one tissue layer to, to correct the tear trough. It's about treating the aging process and all of those layers which are being subject to that to that process. And as you say, um, age does accentuate the tear trough because of the uh, descent and deflation of the soft tissue envelope. And I think a lot of older patients are suddenly becoming. To, uh, it's becoming more visible because they didn't see it when they were younger. They didn't have a natural tear trough, and now it becomes incredibly evident. Uh, again, in combination with that palpable malar uh, groove area. So aging is uh, is an an incredibly important subject that we need the patients to understand because. I find the frustration with the tear trough is that patients want to have it completely eradicated and that is the difficult thing to do because we can't eradicate it because it's natural topography of, of, of the face, you know, it's, it's supposed to be, it's supposed to be there. Uh, and that's really the challenge because I think the biggest challenge with the tear trough, Raoul, and we'll start to sort of touch on the anatomy, is the absence of subcutaneous fat in the tear trough. I think that's where the problem really does lie when it comes to uh, discoloration of this this area yes absolutely and this is one of the challenges that I initially encountered with patients which is um, the patient was actually bothered by the pigmentation in that area and not actually by a hollow or by a groove so this is when the education comes you know from us to our patients comes uh, into consideration and we have to explain to them that there is a variation in layers there. We have the thinnest skin in the body, then underneath that skin there is muscle. The color of the muscle is dark and then under that there is bone. So we have three layers in the tear trough. Yeah, and it's only, it's only three, three centimeters or 30 millimeters long as well. It's not a huge, a huge structure. And so when I do the patient consultation, we really get them to discuss or, or explain to us what they feel that their dark circles are mm -hmm. and how long they've had them for is it a familial thing as it appeared sort of quickly are they taking medications and what are they using are they using cosmetics are they using things like retinols hydroquinones have they had any other treatment because there's lots and lots of treatments available for uh, under eye dark circles let's call it as, yeah so those pigmentation you know laser and i think Hyaluronic acid fillers is only one uh, one arm really of the arsenal of things that you could tend to use for for this. And again, it's understanding what is the cause really. It's not just always a tear trough. Because I know and you know that sometimes when you do correct a tear trough, you suddenly see a hyperpigmentation which is buried in the trough itself. It comes out and now you're left with a new challenge which is pigmentation so the patients haven't uh, seen this and you push it into the light and it becomes evident uh, and again this this eradication of this area where patients want to have it completely obliterated I think that's the first thing I say yeah absolutely. I, you, you're not going to get rid of this completely we're going to soften we're going to bring this out into the light and I think that should be the first thing that you see within your consultation process you're going to you're going to you've walked in with a tear trough you're going to walk out with a tear trough it's going to be less uh, visible it's going to be improved but it's still going to be there yes yeah, so very important point there lee because managing patient expectations for the tear trough and for any other treatment indication is very important and as you said if the patient walked in with a tear trough they're going to walk out with with one however we can manipulate the tissues and potentially get rid of a, of a groove um, in order to smooth the transition between the lower eyelid and the cheek. However, the patient will still have a tear trough. Now, 
Sorry. It's okay. Challenges. One of the things I found the most difficult when I was learning to do these treatments is the patient selection. Is that just me or is it something that you see a lot? No, it, patient selection is uh, huge. It's one of the biggest factors uh, that we have, the challenges that we have, because uh, what you try to do with your patients is you try to help them. And sometimes you will take on a case which is uh, a surgical case and you know you may be trying to deal with some uh, palpable uh, bags or festoons and you're trying to help the patient by giving them what they want and you think it's going to soften it it doesn't really end up that way you then left with male or edema and an unhappy patient because of the patient selection I think patient selection is critical here uh, especially on those aging patients and first thing I look for is uh, mid-face loss, volume loss. Do we have volume loss in the mid-face? And uh, I know you, uh, this is one of your favorite topics, mid-face aging and the vectors. So I'll, I, I, I like the way you say vector as well. So I'm gonna pass this over here, to you. Here you have it guys, the scow's abusing me, okay? Okay, so for those of you watching in English, a vector is a vector. vector. Okay, so it's the same thing. It's the so same thing, it sounds the same, vector. So, so Ra's gonna discuss a positive and neutral and a negative vector in terms of uh, mid-face and tear trough, okay? okay? You are definitely a negative vector in my life. Okay, that's not a problem. Well, I'm here to help. This is, this is one of the things that we see. Um, Sometimes, you know, we have the younger cohort of patients that come to us complaining of the dark circles. But then I think that the vast majority of patients that we see for tear troughs, they have gone through the aging process. And a lot of this, these patients, they have those palpable bags, right? Those lower eyelid bags. So for me to assess if I can actually improve this with an injectable, what I would uh, assess is their profile. And I'm going to grab a, a straight structure like a marking pencil, and I'm going to look from a profile perspective with my patient looking uh, straight ahead. What has the most anterior projection from the cornea to the anterior mid face? Is it the eye or is it the cheek? Because if it's the cheek, that's a positive vector. That means that you can treat the tear trough and the palpebromalar group directly. If it's actually the eye, then that is a negative vector. So some of these patients are surgical and some of these patients, they might be suited for a mid-phase treatment, for anterior mid-phase treatment to the SU for some form of improvement. However, I'm not sure we'll be able to correct them because there's all these other factors as well, like the thickness of the skin, how severe the palpable bag is, et cetera, that we must take into consideration. So what you're saying is that with the assessment uh, and improvement in the tear trough can be made by treating the anterior mid face. Uh, yes. yes. So the, the, we, can, we can do a direct treatment, which is to directly treat the tear trough and the palpable group, or an indirect treatment, which is to treat the anterior mid face, the SUF. And this is why when we're learning, you know, the tear troughs tends to be one of the, probably the last areas that we progress on to right during our journey as, as, as injectors. Um, we can treat a lot of uh, tear troughs indirectly by just having successful treatments to the anterior mid face. Yeah, and it, there's, there's lots of evidence on, on treating and, and, and different approaches. You know, you've got Lambros, Stuttman, um, Haddock, Hermann, all with these different approaches uh, and classifications uh, of the tear trough. But for me first, if the patient has a negative vector then or a neutral vector, then you're gonna have to create a positive vector, which is gonna really, in essence, shorten the tear trough and improve the light reflection. So it would be mid-face first, and then tear trough and palpable malar groove. So again, always do the assessment of the mid-face. The, so the anatomy, like you said, the layers, and we've got the size of a very small structure and its, and its position. Vasculature, do you think it's a dangerous area to inject into? Is it, like we said in, in one of the previous episodes, would you class this as a high risk or a low risk uh, area of injection? I, I think it's, it's definitely one of the higher risks uh, of uh, injections. And this is an area where depth is of the utmost important because the dangers in terms of the vasculature and in terms of the lymphatics are 
above the muscle. So remember, we have three layers here. So the injections should be deep to the muscle always. Yeah, do you agree? Yeah. 100%. It's both uh, safety and predictability of the results. 90% of the vessels are above uh, the muscle. And as Raoul said, you can access something called the prezygomatic space. It's, it's out here. It's underneath the muscle. And your cannula will glide through this space, really positioning you in the, in the ideal, ideal position. Um, and being very, very uh, careful and respectful for the lymphatics as well as the blood supply around this area because the blood supply comes from the infraorbital it will come from the angular um, the uh, inferior uh, palpable arcades it's an incredibly vascular area and again uh, I think there's uh, evidence in the publications is that the angular vein sits around about two millimeters underneath the tear trough mm -hmm. so again this comes down to very nicely into technique so what's your technique and what techniques are available when it comes to the non-surgical management of the tear trough so the number one thing I take into consideration is what you just pointed out in terms of the, the risks. What is the most common risk that we see in the tear trough? It's not necessarily vascular risks, um, it's with the lymphatics. And we know that the vast majority of the lymphatics in this area are superficial, so they would be above the muscle. So for me, whatever technique I employ must ensure that my product is delivered under the muscle. Now, there are two different ways, right? Or there's more than one way to skin a cat, some people say. Um, cannula or, or needle. I personally, for the tear trough, use a cannula. And I like to uh, position my product underneath the muscle with my cannula. And then I like to roll the product and mold the product with a cotton tip and roll it towards the tear trough. So that way, not even my cannula is that close to the, to the vein. Now, the considerations for me in terms of using a different tool like a needle, which I see a lot of colleagues very successfully use needles for these uh, treatments. I formerly used a needle a lot for this uh, treatment. The considerations we must take is uh, the depth. Now, yes, your needle can touch the periosteum, but remember, there's very little space there between the skin and the bone there if you're using a needle. So if the bevel of your needle is what, 1.2 millimeters, 1 .4, yeah. and then you have just over two millimeters of space there in between that area, you're, even though your needle is touching the periosteum, as soon as you press the plunger and the product extrudes, then some of that product might migrate and end up in the muscle or more superficially. So if you're using a needle at that area, at that plane, I think that we need to adjust our angle of injections, maybe a 45 degree. Yeah, I agree. The bevel has to be sort of flat down to, yes. towards the bone here. But then you risk those other things, especially under eye hematoma, because it's rich in its vascularity. And Sluggish I think, lymphatics as well. I think this is one of those areas where you, where you really think to yourself, if I get a hematoma here, it's gonna look, it's not gonna look great. And you, you know, you have those vintages of, of hematomas that are gonna last for around about two weeks. Yeah. It goes through the whole rainbow of colors breakdown. And that's what I found when I, my formal training was with a needle and it was um, 90 degree down, but very strangely, it was a 45 degree into the tear trough. And when I look back oh, now, okay. I'm thinking, wow, yeah. you know, how I, how I didn't cause more uh, damage. And again, um, like you touched on, uh, is the rheology. I think if you're using more than, I would suggest, 0 0.5 of product in a tear trough, then you've diagnosed the, 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 the problem incorrectly. It's, it's, you you're likely to. to be a surgical case or you've got a negative uh, vector negative into the vector. mid face. So mm -hmm. again, you've got to start uh, really thinking about how you assess uh, the tear troughs. And one of the things that, again, in one of the other episodes that we did, we seem to be afraid of referring the patient for a surgical opinion because it, it's almost like you can't help them and now they're at this terminal end point where the only thing can, uh, they can access is surgery. But I always say surgical option is always a good option. It's great patient management for me. If you can't do it and if you feel that you're not going to get a result, then the, the obvious next call is, is, is surgery anyway. So Definitely. Work with a network of colleagues that you're comfortable referring to and your patients will love you for it. Um, okay, Lee, so to recap, 
Um, we've talked about the anatomy, we've talked about the aging process, we've talked a bit about technique and a little bit about um, rheology. Um, complications? Okay. In this area? The complications here, it's, it's, it's fairly high, but it's not just an issue with the vascularity, it's because I would suggest technique and product choice. Is, uh, is incorrect along with the assessment of the patient. So if you look at the tissue forces applied to a tear trough, it's low shear and low compression. So again, you're gonna to have to use a product which is incredibly light. So it hasn't got a big G prime to translate its rheological powers to the skin. And it also has this low cohesivity to allow it to spread within this very thin plane. The other thing that you're gonna need with your product is a product which is low hygroscopic or low... Hygroscopy. Uh, yeah. It really doesn't want to drag water into this area. So I think when you choose in your product, you have to choose it wisely. And you have to think low G prime, low compression, low hygroscopy. Those are the three uh, real sort of things that you need on your list for, for rheology in this area. Anything else which is added to it, which is going to help uh, redensify the skin, is a bonus, but those are, the, those are the things that I would look for. The reasons why I wouldn't use a thicker or particular uh, uh, filler is that classic age-old complication we had with Tyndall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've already got a slight blue tinge in there. Adding filler superficially, which is particular, is just gonna add sort of fuel to the fire. Um, I don't know what you used back in the, back in the day, but um, we were using pretty much anything we could get our hands on at that time. What about you? Um, I, I was using hyaluronic acid fillers, uh, not particulate ones, um, and I was using uh, you know 15 milligrams per um, cc of hyaluronic acid, um, but they were very hydrophilic. So um, the take-home message back then was uh, undercorrect. Undercorrect, undercorrect, because then let the product do what it does, which is to uh, cause edema. Now that's good if if you get the amounts and you choose a patient correctly. I mean, you end up with a patient initially after the treatment that's a little bit underwhelmed because mm. it's like oh, and then you tell them, no, no, it's going to get better with time. But also you have there the potential of it becoming worse. And we've already stated that edema is probably the number one complication here. The lymphatics in this area, naturally, as we age, they get more and more sluggish. So it is a high complication rate by using a very hydrophilic product there, I feel. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm in complete agreement with you. And again, because we have this gaze pattern where we look at each other's eyes mm. more than any other, then any lump or bump or, 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 or palpability, visibility under the skin, it's going to be really evident, uh, really evident straight away. Uh, so edema is this huge challenge because the, the complications which I see around the tear trough are based around malar edema uh, with it. And can we avoid it? Well, I'd like to think that we need to go back to anatomy. And again, David Funt has written a beautiful paper on uh, malar edema and uh, the phenomenon and, and really why this occurs. Because this can be an incredibly frustrating um, uh, condition for both the practitioner yes. and, and the patient. I don't know how you would manage uh, a if, malar edema. You know, that's one of the most difficult things to manage uh, because yes, you can use hyaluronidase and it might settle down, but then it comes back and that's something that sometimes the patients have to live with for for years and years and you have to do repeated um, treatments to try and um, and get rid of it yeah and i always discuss that straight away in the consultation process um, if the lymphatics have, have been compromised it can take over a year uh, to resolve themselves and uh, we've seen cases up to 18 months two years where uh, Hyaluronidase and oral corticosteroids have been thrown at the patient uh, every other month and the situation's fluctuated and it's basically just been the lymphatics. So that's one of the things in the consultation process I discuss with the patient before we start is if there is a, a persistent swelling that we can't get rid of with our treatment uh, modalities, then it's likely to be the lymphatics with it. Going back to your earlier point on under correction, I always say to the patients, we're gonna do a one-to-one -one correction. And again, one of the complications 
I would add this to a complication is is a lack of satisfaction from from the from the treatment is to take uh, a before a during so a split and then an after and again showing the patient half uh, half of the treatment or hemi face they really get a nice difference it's when you do both and you sit them up they lose the reference points very quickly so I would suggest that you do uh, show the patient halfway through the treatment and then take a photograph over the coming episodes, we're not going to talk about photographs as being photographs. We're going to talk about photographs being a non-biased second opinion because that's really what we use them for. Yeah, we don't. We sometimes use them to show off, but we use them to show the patient that there is a difference or there was a difference, uh, and to really. Uh, it's a medical legal document. Right? Yeah, but it's also an education educational document for them as well. So edema is a huge, a huge problem. And edema, I find frustrating because you don't see it straight away. It normally raises its ugly head around about a week to two weeks post-treatment. Yes. And that's where the frustration lies. So the patient will, will call you and say, I've got a lump under my eye. And you look back at your, uh, your post-operative photographs and go, wow. Yeah, that wasn't yeah. there before. Yeah, it wasn't. No, <laughs> so it's these. It's this issue with the with the lymphatics, which is the which is the issue. So, do you think it's just the anatomy? Do you think it's the technique, or do you think it's a product, or do you think maybe it's the combination of the whole the whole thing? Well, you've answered that. It's definitely the combination of of all of those things. So, um, my take home message is depth, uh, technique, and product here um, in terms of treating the the tear trough, uh, and. To wrap up, Lee, I'd like to ask you one question because we all know that you love reading. You're a highly educated person. Any of those classifications that you just mentioned for the tear troughs, are they surgical classifications or are they pertinent to injectable treatments, non-surgical treatments? Well, they're normally born out of surgical. And again, extrapolating those into, uh, into aesthetic medicine, we're gonna to have to be incredibly careful. Uh, and again, some of these are very subjective Again, you'll have four types, Herman's four types. Again, we're gonna to have to think about the classifications, why we're using them. Is it for us or is it for the patient or is it a combination of, of the both? I would suggest my, uh, my sort of summary or finishing tips is assessment is crucial with these patients. Um, asking about pre-existing lymphatics especially in the older patients, you know, do you get puffy eyes? Um, be careful using toxin as well at the same time as you do the tear trough again, because you can uh, alter the lymphatics just by the, the mechanical action of the pumping of the orbicularis uh, oculi. Um, but again, I'll go back and really understand your anatomy, your technique, and more importantly, your product choice in this critical, uh, very delicate area here. Perfect. Well. We're going to leave it at that. Thank you so much for joining us again here. Please subscribe to our channel and also leave your comments down below. Let us know what you'd like us to cover in these uh, shows here. And um, we had one comment, Lee. They uh, requested uh, if we can uh, interview Mrs. Uh, Valerie Topan, uh, the CEO and uh, uh, founder of Tioxin. So we'll, we'll see if we can get her down to the studio. Uh, at some point, but we're going to have uh, lots of very interesting guests uh, interacting here with us. And Lee, please tell people where they can find you. They can find me on Instagram, Lee Walker underscore Academy, or on Facebook with the same. And where can they find you, Raoul? Instagram at uh, DRCETTO, Dr. Cheto. Thank you so much for joining us, and goodbye from Tokyo. And sayonara from Tokyo. <laughs>